You're standing on the beach. Then you hear it. A deep, rising roar. You expect a boat, but what you see is something else entirely. A machine sliding straight across the water, then over the shore, and up the beach like it doesn't even notice the terrain has changed. There's not even wheels or much splash. It's not flying, but it's not floating either. And the moment you see it, one question takes hold. What is this thing? And if it's that good, why don't we have more of these? A hovercraft has a hull, a deck, even a rudder. But something's different. It doesn't sit in the water like ships relying on buoyancy. It floats just a little above it. It rides on a thin cushion of pressurized air, constantly fed by downward-facing fans. It's not sealed, though. Air constantly leaks out from underneath. That's part of the design. The fans keep pumping air in faster than it escapes. And that trapped air lifts the vehicle 15 to 30 centimeters off the ground. The result is a vehicle that barely touches the terrain. Water, mud, grass, sand, it doesn't matter. Once it's up, all it needs is a push, usually from a separate set of propulsion fans or propellers mounted at the back. These give it forward motion, and small rudders behind them steer the craft like a boat. Modern hovercraft can reach speeds of 80 to 130 kilometers per hour, making them faster than most boats of comparable size. Hovercraft exist because engineers were trying to escape a problem. Boats are great on water, until you reach the shoreline. Ground vehicles are great on land, until they hit a marsh or river. And airplanes? Efficient, yes, but expensive, loud, and not much good without a runway. They wanted a vehicle that wouldn't get hung up in shallow water or need a dock to pull into. The first real breakthrough came in the 1950s, when British engineer Christopher Cockrell tested his theory using a vacuum cleaner motor, a cat food tin, and kitchen scales. He realized that by directing a stream of air downward into a circular skirt, you could create a floating cushion, not just of air, but of pressure. One that could lift a vehicle, reduce friction to almost zero, and work on multiple surfaces. The first full-scale test vehicle, the SRN-1, successfully crossed the English Channel on July 25, 1959, exactly 50 years after Louis Blériot's historic flight across the same waters. By the 1960s, the British military had them for beach landings. Ferry companies were running them across the Channel. Rescue teams brought them out during floods. And speaking of military innovation across sea and land, let's talk about this video's sponsor. War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, covering air, land, and sea warfare. You're piloting fighters, commanding tanks, or operating warships, including submarines. The game features over 2,500 vehicles from 10 nations, spanning from World War II era machines to modern jets. Each vehicle is modeled with attention to historical detail. Best of all, you can also customize your vehicles with different camo patterns, historical unit markings, and decorations, including designs made by the community. You can choose your playstyle, fast arcade mode, realistic battles, or full simulator. Controls work with mouse and keyboard, joystick, or touchscreen. War Thunder is available for free on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and mobile. Sign up using our links in the pinned comment or video description to get a massive bonus pack for new and returning players that haven't played for at least six months on PC and consoles. The pack includes multiple premium vehicles, the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 silver lions, and seven days of premium account. This bonus is available for a limited time only. Now, back to how hovercrafts evolved beyond those early military applications. Hydrofoils touch water. Ground effect vehicles need speed. Hovercraft floats stationary or moving. That means managing a delicate balance between pressure lift, thrust force, and weight. Blast too little air and you scrape. Too much and you waste energy. No more, no less. Lift comes from large downward facing fans, usually axial blowers or centrifugal impellers that force high pressure air into a chamber under the craft. This lifts the craft because, according to Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The lift fans must blow a certain volume of air per second to maintain cushion pressure. This can be calculated as mass flow rate, which equals air density multiplied by the duct cross-sectional area multiplied by the velocity of air through the fan. 
Those fans don't just lift once, they have to keep pumping, compensating for every leak at every moment, especially when the hovercraft is turning, accelerating or riding over waves. This is the reason hovercrafts consume more fuel than conventional vessels, typically three to five times as much for equivalent operations. The power required equals cushion pressure multiplied by volumetric flow rate, all divided by the efficiency of the fan system. Add forward thrust, often from a separate set of propellers or ducts, and things get even trickier. Now you've got dynamic pressure pushing you forward while trying to maintain a stable hover height. Imagine you're crossing the English Channel at 50 miles per hour. A piece of debris punches through your skirt. Within seconds, your 20-ton hovercraft loses pressure. It drops onto the water surface, 20 tons of metal suddenly grinding against friction. The craft slows violently. You're fighting to stay upright. The skirt has to flex, bend and collapse, all without tearing or letting too much air escape. Bag skirts, finger skirts, segmented combinations, but they all serve the same core purpose, containment and compliance. The skirt needs to trap air underneath the hovercraft and conform to whatever terrain it's passing over. That means it must absorb shock, deform around obstacles and instantly return to shape. Too rigid and it'll tear, too soft and it'll collapse or flutter. Most people think hovercraft are novelties. They're not. Militaries use them to transport troops and equipment directly from ships to shore. Russia's Zuber-class hovercraft, the world's largest at 555 tonnes, can carry three main battle tanks and 140 troops simultaneously. For all their versatility, hovercraft never became mainstream. They consume far more fuel than boats or trucks of the same size. Operating costs run three to five times higher than conventional ferries, making them economically challenging for regular commercial service. Then there's control. Hovercraft don't steer like boats or cars. They slide, often unpredictably. There's no braking system in the conventional sense. You reduce power and try to let friction slow you down. In tight spaces or crowded environments, that makes them risky to operate. Crosswinds can push them off course, and stopping distances are considerably longer than wheeled vehicles. No crash stop. A torn skirt can cause rapid deflation and loss of control. Operators require specialised training and maintenance is intensive. And perhaps most importantly, they're niche. Most places in the world already have roads, ports or airstrips. And for those places, conventional vehicles are cheaper, easier to repair and better understood. The story of commercial hovercraft service illustrates this perfectly. From the 1960s through the 1990s, cross-channel hovercraft services like the Princess Margaret carried millions of passengers between England and France. Yet, by 2000, most had shut down, unable to compete with the Channel Tunnel and modern high-speed ferries that offered lower costs and better weather reliability. Hovercraft shine when nothing else works. For daily life, though, they're usually overkill. Advances in electric motors and battery technology could solve one of their biggest problems. Noise. They're loud. That air cushion needs constant pressure, which means spinning fans and engines that don't stop. Noise levels regularly exceed 80 decibels, louder than heavy traffic. So, that machine isn't rare because it failed. It's rare because it succeeded at solving a problem most of us don't have. And that's both its limitation and its future. Want to command your own military vehicles? War Thunder is available for free on PC, PlayStation, Xbox and mobile. Use our links in the pinned comment or video description to claim your massive bonus pack. Available for new and returning players that haven't played for at least six months on PC and consoles. You'll get premium vehicles, the exclusive Eagle of Valor decorator, 100,000 silver lions and seven days of a premium account for a limited time only. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring and thanks for watching.